terroir. Does it exist in whiskey? Let's find out. Welcome to another episode of Eric Wade Whiskey Studies, and in this video I'm going to do a review of the Waterford Irish Single Malt, Single Farm Origin Dunbell Edition 1.1. I have really, really, really been looking forward to trying this whiskey ever since I heard about the distillery and what they were doing uh, there in Ireland. Uh, there's been a lot of vibe about it, a lot of talk about it. They've been putting out videos. Uh, Daniel and Rex from the Whiskey Vault and Scott and Bart have made a trip over there and did videos on it. So really, really looking forward to getting into this and uh, talking about whether or not this really carries uh, a sense of terroir or provenance um, as do wines. But before I get into that, here are my notes. Each bottle of Single Farm Origin Dunbill Edition 1.1 has a terroir code which offers an unparalleled level of bottling information on the barley and production process. It's made from 100% Irish grown barley grown by Ned Murphy, east of the river Nor in County Kilkenny. The whiskey is double distilled. It is matured for three years, eight months, and 26 days in 33% first fill U.S. oak, 22% virgin U.S. oak, 26% premium French oak, and 19% in Vindu Natural cask. Vindu Natural is a naturally sweet wine from southern France with a light fortification of an added spirit before fermentation is complete. The whiskey has no added coloring, no chill filtration, or any additives whatsoever. It's bottled at 50% alcohol by volume and sells for about $95 plus shipping and handling if it's not available at your local liquor store. So among small yays, there are about a half a dozen um, topics or issues that which we, we uh, like to debate about. And it's, they're issues that will never, ever be totally resolved. There's been entire articles, books written on the subject of terroir, what is and isn't terroir. It seems it's almost as much of a philosophy and a way of approaching a uh, wine or a now whiskey as it is an, an actual something in reality. And it starts to go beyond, in some ways, beyond science and into philosophy and a certain mental attitude and the way in which you approach uh, the land, the way you approach the base ingredient, and of course, the way you produce, uh, produce the end product, whether it's a wine or a whiskey. Um, one thing for the Wine Spur Educational Trust Diploma, which is how I got into whiskey to begin with, I bought a huge stack of books that I would required reading, and one of them uh, was really, really informative. And that is uh, James Wilson's book on uh, terroir. Not an inexpensive book and a, not a light reading book. Uh, well, it's got graphs and pictures, fairly a small print. It is really, really, it's a textbook. It's not uh, sort of a light uh, reading. So the subtitle for the book is uh, The Role of Geology, Climate, and Culture in the Making of French Wines. So... I could do a whole hour talking about this topic of terroir. Uh, the, one of the other topics that's kind of funny uh, and, and that is controversial in the wine world is the matter of uh, closures, cork versus screw cap or Stelman cap. Uh, the Wine Spectator years ago did an entire uh, uh, issue on this very subject. And there are pros and cons to both. There are arguments about how much this really reflects terroir and, not, and whether or not it's even important, which is kind of funny because <laughs> this bottle um, it kind of evades the issue because it doesn't have a screw cap, it doesn't have a cork, it has this glass topper, which I kind of like, to tell you the truth. It seems to work really well, fit really well, and remains fairly tight, and yet I didn't find it too difficult to remove. So, I, I like that. So, rather than get to a whole lecture on the subject of terroir, terroir basically is a sense of place, that the end product is a reflection of where it's from and the natural environment affects and is reflected in the end product. Now, this is true of just about anything you can think of. If you grow a particular species of apples in one place and you grow that same apples in another place, the apples are gonna be a little bit different because of where they're grown. This is due to soils, water, climate, whether or not there are any herbicides, and so on and so forth, right? 
Same thing goes for grapes. You grow the same uh, type of grape, same clone of grape in two different places, and you're going to get two different wines. Now, that's not the only thing that affects the profile of a wine. You know, the yeast that you use, the, the oak, the, uh, the fermentation, the rate of fermentation, and so on and so forth. There's just like a hundred different issues that uh, make a wine or a whiskey as to what it is. So, uh, even though the word terroir means dirt, you know, we get our Jack Russell Terrier or, or dogs that like to dig into the dirt. Um, it's The concept is much bigger than that. Now, for the French, terroir is so important, they are willing to lose entire vintages, hence millions and millions and millions of dollars, in order to preserve their philosophy and approach to wine. So, for example, uh, 2013 in Burgundy in Bordeaux, the vineyards got absolutely uh, plummeted, uh, just pummeled uh, by hail. It was a really, 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 really bad vintage. In fact, when I went to the uh, Institute of Masters of Wine uh, Bordeaux tasting, which I would normally do interviews and videos and stuff like that, I was told don't do any interviews because it, it, it was such a bad vintage. Now, in contrast to that, down in Chile, which also has issues of hail, Chile has these nets that they put over the vineyards. Uh, so when they know that a hail storm is coming, they protect their vineyards. So, uh, the concept of terroir is a philosophical one which can have economic impacts. So when the French are willing to say, you know what, to have a sense of place is so important. We, we would rather lose the entire vintage of wines, lose millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars that interfere with the natural weather uh, patterns for that vintage. That's how important it is for them. Now, I've really, really been excited about what, what Waterford is doing. I've watched all the videos uh, on their uh, YouTube channel. I'll put a link down below if you want to ch check those out. So what they're doing is essentially taking that sort of, same sort of concept and carrying over into the whiskey world. Now, this is where the debate comes in. Whether or not a wine or a whiskey has a reflection of its place is going to depend on how much you manipulate it. The opposite of terroir is manipulation. Manipulation. The opposite of terroir is manipulation, whether it's mechanical or something that man does. So, um, you're very, the French are very, very limited as to what they can do to sort of manipulate uh, a wines to get the end product. Now, obviously, if you leave grapes alone, they will naturally become vinegar and not wine. So, you can't just take a total hands-off approach. But if you use, say, a natural approach to uh, farming, say organic or biodynamic, and that's a whole, an organic and biodynamic, those are a whole nother set of debates, right? <laughs> the entire articles and books are written on organic and, and biodynamic in the, in the wine world. Those are a whole nother topic, which I'm not even going to get into, uh, but those could come into the wine world as well, or the whiskey world as well. Um, but Anything you do to interfere or to uh, change the natural course of where the grapes are going to go or the grains are going to go, what's going to be an end product, is uh, incrementally reducing the reflection of the sense of place. So all wines have to have some amount of a manipulation because otherwise you're going to end up with spoilage, right? And the same thing would go for whiskeys or beers or anything else. If you grow tomatoes in your backyard, right, whether you use uh, composting or whether you use herbicides or whether you or anything else that affects the soil, it's going to give you a different tomato. You go to your 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 aunt's house, your grandma's, your your neighbor's house, and how and they're growing tomatoes. Why some tomatoes are going to be better than others is going to be, have to do with everything you do with the dirt, right, and how you grow and your approach to it. So. Uh, one of the important things is after uh, the First and Second World War, uh, when which we had a lot of chemicals left over, uh, a lot of chateaus, a lot of vineyards were being bombarded with chemistry in order to manip manipulate the vineyards to supposedly um, get rid of the uh, pests and everything that would, you know, um, attack the grapes. But the, what they were doing was is actually poisoning the land and the result was it had a negative impact on wine so the movement has been and growing ever since then is to move back towards uh, restoring the land have a natural uh, soils natural dirt natural terroir um, and then also not just the dirt but everything else around um, 
uh, the wine or the or now and now the whiskey, including uh, a more gearing more towards using say natural yeasts, which has a danger of um, uh, resulting in a stuck fermentation where you're fermenting your uh, sugars to alcohol and the fermentation sticks. When you get a stuck fermentation, now you now, you, now you're in a battle because now your wine may go to spoil it. So now you, you're in a race to do something to get the fermentation going again. It, it, uh, and so some, particularly the large mass producers of wine, will use a wine, a yeast that they know will be thorough in finishing the fermentation. So that's just another little uh, uh, element. So whether a distillery in when they're uh, fermenting their uh, their grains and in, in, in their mash, right? Whether using a natural yeast or introducing a yeast, that will be another impact on the profile of the whiskey and whether or not it um, reflects a sense of place, right? Right, right. So, not all wines express terroir. Uh, in fact, I would say most of your inexpensive wines uh, have a high degree of manipulation. Using manual labor is very, very, very expensive. Manual sorting is very, 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 very expensive. So they tend to uh, use a lot of machinery to harvest, which is less uh, particular about what it pulls off. It tends to introduce a lot of what's called material other than grapes or, or mog um, in order to, say, deal with all the pests. They sometimes it will use uh, pesticides and herbicides. That also uh, affects the sense of terroir. So the big bulk mass-produced wines tend to be the same year in, year out. They don't change from vintage to vintage, and uh, you, you get, you're getting a really highly manipulated product. They can even use added coloring, such as a grape extract called a mega purple to add more coloring. Uh, they may increase the acidity by adding bags of tartaric acid. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that, that uh, may go on. And the result is uh, a wine which some people, will, I've heard people say this, oh, I, I, I can't, can't drink red wine, uh, I'm allergic to sulfites. Your body produces sulfites. There's more there's sulfites in um, dehydrated fruit, right? You go to the store, you buy some dehydrated, there's more in your dehydrated fruit than there is in wine. If you're drinking cheap wine, mass-produced wine that does not reflect the sense of terroir, you are getting something other than grapes. You're getting mog in your wine, including pesticides and herbicides that might be causing a headache. Now, most headaches are a result of, you know, not, not drinking enough water and dehydration. You know, that's really a result. But some people are having an allergic reaction. It's actually a result of things that shouldn't be in your wine. So anytime someone tells me, oh, I'm allergic to sulfites, I ask them, so what wines have you tried? And when I recommend drinking some more uh, or maybe organically farmed and more um, hands-off, better, highly produced wines, which are going to get more expensive, um, I, I tell them, try this and you'll find that you're not going to be getting that uh, a reaction. You know, they say this, their skin turns red because you're uh, responding to not something which is natural, but something which has been introduced, which is, and I know I'm going on and on in a whiskey video, but I'm approaching the, the concept here. You're uh, reacting to something which shouldn't be in your wine. All right. So to get back to whiskey, the producers of this whiskey, namely Mark Wenier, he has taken this whole concept, which I've barely even touched on in this video, from wine over into whiskey. And so they go into great uh, length to have an oversight of all the little details of uh, the whiskey production so that every grain, every truck, every delivery, every barrel, every yeast, everything you can think of is being tracked so that when there is a transparency which is available, I mean, on their website, the average consumer is probably not gonna be interested in everything that they put on their website, but total transparency so you can know what went into producing that whiskey, but also so that as much as possible uh, the whiskey will reflect its sense of place so that uh, the barley from one field will reflect differently in the spirit than the barley from another field, even if they're the same strain of barley. There are somewhere around 300 strains of barley. There are 10 that are more commonly used uh, in the, in the uh, whiskey industry. So 
if you were to take the same strain of barley, put in two different fields, which had different soils, maybe slightly different uh, microclimates. There's another big word, another thing that's debated. You have climate and you have microclimates, the slightly different temperatures within a smaller area um, and everything else. Then you end up with different aromas and flavors of the spirit produced from those two different barleys. Now, this concept of recognizing the difference of uh, terroir has been going on for since the time of the monks, at least the 1400s. All right? I got a whole book on that as well, on monks and wine. It's been recognized. Now, they didn't know the science behind it. They didn't know why it was. They just recognized these Pinot Noir grapes are different over here than these Pinot Noir grapes are different uh, from over here. These produce a better wine than over here. So they actually mapped out Burgundy and the different terroir, the different uh, soils and so forth and how they were reflected in the grapes. And then the classification system was built from there. The idea is, is that not only do grapes do that, but apples will do that and tomatoes will do that. Anything you grow is going to have a different aromas and flavors based on where it's grown if you don't uh, overly manipulate it. The debated issue is regarding whiskey is, is all that stripped away through the distillation process? That's really the hub of the issue. And the only way you would know is if you took two barleys, same strain, two plots of land, distill them exact, ferment them and distill them exactly the same and then see what the new make is like and to see the differences in the new make, and then age them in the same way, in the same sort of cast, and come out with the final end product is with the whiskey. That's the only way you would know. And the only way you can know that and be sure of that is if you kept detailed information on every single little thing so that nothing got mixed up. So if you're being highly scientific in your documentation of everything that you do. So the result is, in terms of the whiskey, is not only are there differences in uh, from bottling to bottling and field to field and farm to farm, uh, but all of this, I would say, tells a story about the whiskey without having to use a, a big uh, sort of sh uh, schlock marketing scheme, right? You don't have to make up some BS story about the whiskey because the whiskey is going to tell the story. The history of the production of this bottle tells its own story. You just need to make it known and available uh, to the consumer. Alrighty. Now, there's a lot more that could be said uh, about this topic, and I'm sure it, 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 in the comments down below, there's people who are going to debate me, people are going to disagree, and there are going to be people who are going to argue. Welcome to, <laughs> welcome to the world and conversations that typical sommeliers have. This, this is what we do. What really probably what most of you want to know is, okay, is the whiskey any good? Is the whiskey any good? And we're going to get it. I'm going to talk more about terroir and this will be, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about this in, in live streams and so forth, but let's get down to it. Is the whiskey any good? All right. First of all, let's take a look at the color. Uh, sort of a medium straw gold on the nose. I would say this whiskey has an insane evolution. I mean, it has a serious ride. The entry and the mid and the and the finish are radically distinct. It starts off with a lot of citrus, lemon, maybe a little bit of uh, orange, vanilla. Va I mean, a huge amount of vanilla, vanilla bean. There's a slight herbal note to it, almost like a wintergreen, mint character. And yet there's also this um, sort of strong lemon and orange character. There's also, I would say, some stone fruit notes, a little bit of peach, perhaps a little bit of apricot. All right, on the palate. Lemon, orange, vanilla up front. Mid palate, you get uh, a wintergreen herbal character. It's like a, 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 some tea. The vanilla is persistent. Then it goes into sort of a really fresh, vibrant wintergreen. 
So it has like in the mid palette, it has like some moderate green characteristics to it. And then what really, really lingers is this very, very distinct, strong mint character. It's medium bodied. I can get a yeasty note. There's that definite multi note there. The peaches and apricot are there. So this is sort of like that tart uh, apricot character there as well. Really ripe peaches as well. And what really, really lingers is that mint character. But it's also, there's a little bit there, it's almost as if someone took a branch off your Christmas tree and stuck it in there. There's that very sort of piney character as well. And the finish is really, really long. As I'm talking now, I can still I can still taste it. In fact, this almost has an effect on your palate the way a uh, an herbal uh, cough drop, like a Ricola or something like that has your mind, because it really super lingers. In fact, probably an hour from now, if I don't drink anything else, I'll still be tasting that, that herbal uh, green character to it. Now, I think in terms of recommendation of a whiskey, I'm, I'm, I've been thinking really, really hard about how to score this whiskey. I, I'm really challenged in giving it a score. This is not a whiskey for everyone. This is a whiskey which I personally think is really, really good. It's fascinating. You can tell it's well-crafted. Uh, it's, it's amazing in that sense, and yet, I. I would like to see more age on it. I'd like to see more age on it. Um, years ago, uh, I had a friend of mine, I was with his, uh, his family, we were in the, in the minivan, and their three-year-old, I was sitting in the, you know, in the seat back, and the three-year-old daughter sitting next to me. And uh, she started humming this tune. And I recognized it's from Mozart. Dun, 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 dun. And I was like, it's a three-year-old girl. I mean, this too. And I was like, wow. And she was learning to play the piano, right? And immediately, I mean, this was a girl you had to like, you know, stop playing the piano. She was so into playing the piano and she was really, really, really gifted. And you could see at that three-year-old, wow, this is a gifted little girl who has an ear for music, much like her mother. It has an ear for music. And you can just see, wow, in the future, she's really, really going to be something of, of, of a musician. That's sort of my take on this whiskey. I think it has a lot of great potential. I, I, it, you can see it, it's got the good elements there, but it needs time. I think it needs more time. Now me, as a whiskey student, as a whiskey geek, um, there's no way in the world I would not buy this whiskey. All right, absolutely. What I would actually like to do is perhaps get another bottle hold on to that one, and then five years from now, see if I can get another release, something with more age on it, and do a comparison. In fact, what I would really like to have is a bottle of new make. I would like to be able to taste this as new make and do a comparison between new make and this bottle, and then when they have another release from this particular uh, farm, then do a comparison, because I would like to see the evolution of the whiskey as it gets more age. So if you are a whiskey geek, and or a whiskey nerd, right? And that's really what you're into, then I would say, yeah, this is something you definitely want to pick up, 95 bucks, but I also guarantee you, um, as the reputation of the distillery grows, as it begins to have a cultural impact, I think, that's the other thing about this distillery, I think a lot of other distilleries, they may not go as far into it as uh, Waterford does, but I think they're gonna have a cultural impact and a different approach to making whiskeys in Ireland and around the world. And that, which is another reason why I'm so excited about this distillery because they're gonna have a huge cultural impact. Just as some chateau or wineries and when they uh, do really, really, really well, other wineries sort of get the hint and start changing the way they do things, right? They become more organic in their farming. They get rid of the herbicides, they get rid of the pesticides, they start paying more attention to the specifics of particular plots of land for the vineyards. I think in the same way, I think a lot more distillers are going to at least head somewhat more in this direction. Now, again, I, another topic I can get into, there's actually distilleries in Texas, maybe not to this extent or in this approach, but they also recognize that they have a unique terroir, a unique climate, and so they are producing whiskeys that reflect that in their Texas style of whiskeys. So this thought, this concept, this philosophy of producing whiskey is already in existence um, out of, in places other than uh, Waterford. So, if you are a geek about whiskey, then I'm going to say yes, 
If you can get a bottle, buy a bottle. If you're a person who doesn't care about all that, doesn't care about all the behind the scenes stuff, you just want something you're really, really gonna like, right? You just wanna pop the cork, drink a good whiskey. I think the finish on the whiskey, those, those very distinctive herbal, uh, minty, uh, wintergreen pine characters, you may not like that character. You may not like that um, because it is so strong. Now, I find this whiskey also to sort of be very vibrant, very lively. It seems like a very lively whiskey. And, and I like that too. It's almost like, you almost say refreshing. It's the way in which if you ever have a, uh, a Bordeaux white wine, which is a blend of uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Simeon, they, they can, can have that sort of beauty of the, the, the uh, grapefruit, uh, carry the floral notes and sort of the rounder uh, edges to it. Other than say a Sauvignon Blanc, say from New Zealand or from uh, the Loire Valley or California coast, this kind of reminds me of that as well. Alrighty, so I've gone on and on and on. I'm not going to give it a score. I'm not going to give it a score, but I'm going to say this is a whiskey for whiskey geeks. This is not for your typical average consumer, and that's what I'm going to say. If you're a whiskey geek, buy a bottle. If you can't, if you can't, I mean the the release is limited. If you're not a whiskey geek, you just want something you're going to enjoy, you're not going to take a risk and a challenge on something that's going to be very, 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 very different than what you're customary to drinking, then you're probably not going to want to drink it, right? You're not going to be the person who's going to want to go, you know, and check out the code on the back of the bottle, go on the website and look at all the details. That's who this is for, the person who's really, really going to be into that. Alrighty, this has been a rather long uh, video. Um, if you've watched it all the way through, I want to thank you very much. There's more to discuss. There's more to discuss and more to get into. Uh, if you like my videos and you have not yet subscribed, I want to ask that you subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when I post a new video or go live. And if you are uh, part of my Patreon group, I want to thank you very much for being a member of my little group. All right, until next time, cheers.